now. Detonate the reality bomb! I will build a great, great wall. Some alien race to come down and threaten us. Is the singularity near? The truth is out there. The military industrial complex. The seven mountains of the influencers of culture. To be as gods, you know. Change has come to America. Catapult of propaganda. From a secure location on top of the ridge in the heart of the beautiful Missouri Ozarks, this is a view from the bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. The crash of a small airplane off the Hawaiian islands in late 2013 may be the key through which we can understand the nature of the deep state's attempts to control our lives. Welcome to a view from the bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. We thank you for listening at VFTB.net. If you're watching this on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Derek Gilbert, make sure you follow along closely because we'll have some um, graphics to uh, accompany this conversation, which will help um, explain the opening statement today. Our guests, have been investigating a uh, this crash I referenced and uh, do so with some expertise. Uh, first, we'll bring in a, a gentleman who's got th- nearly three decades' experience in the aviation industry, both as a flight instructor and as a former CEO and president of several companies involved in the aviation industry. And he is the co-author of the book that is the subject of our conversation today, the book called The Fuddy Hoax, uh, co-authored with Nellie Ristvet. Uh, we welcome Hugo Fugan to the program for the first time. Hugo, good to talk with you again. Good morning. And uh, accompanying him, a gentleman who has some um, insight in the event that took place on December 11th of 2013, uh, the crash of this small plane um, that uh, carried the uh, uh, the woman whose name is on the title of the book, Loretta Fuddy. Uh, we will call him uh, W. W, we appreciate you taking time out of your schedule this morning. Of course. Glad to be here. Uh, Hugo, we'll, we'll open with you. Uh, you. You make an interesting comment. And the website, by the way, for the book, I'll point out right at the front here, is thefuddyhoax.com. That's T-H-E-F-U-D-D-Y-H-O-A-X, thefuddyhoax.com. Um, I, I guess a couple of questions just to open it from a broad perspective. Um, who was Loretta Fuddy? And why do you call the crash of the plane uh, in which she? we are told she lost her life? Uh, why do you call it the Rosetta Stone for deep state hoaxes? Yeah, those are interesting questions. Thank you. Uh, Loretta Fuddy was, uh, for a brief time, probably about three years, uh, the director of the Hawaii Department of Health. And she was appointed to that position in a very unique way, uh, where uh, Governor Abercrombie at the time held a press conference and uh, basically announced that the current director was resigning and he didn't even know why he was resigning. And he replaced that as the governor replaced um, this guy named Neil Palafox with Fuddy in just an instant. She came out of nowhere, didn't have the kind of credentials that one usually has in that position. She had no medical degree as uh, the previous uh, occupants of that did. But she did have other experience, and she was the, uh, I think, North American uh, chairman of an organization called Sabud, uh, which uh, back in the 60s in Indonesia was uh, criticized by the then president of uh, Indonesia, uh, Sukarno, as being a CIA front. And uh, that does suggest some background for Loretta Fuddy and her association with that organization, and particularly as she rose to great heights Mm -hmm. in that organization. And we'll note that that organization has, among uh, others, offices in Hawaii, in Seattle, in uh, Langley, Virginia, uh, just by coincidence. Really? So Loretta Fuddy was uh, just newly into this position and just as quickly exited that position um, three years later. Now, she was one... And, and by the way, uh, with, Hugo, there's only about 3,000 members in this organization in the whole world, so it's not like it's some huge organization. It's a very fringe operation. It's very small. If there's even 3,000 members uh, in the organization, that that even is probably cooking the books. So it's not some monstrous organization, the number, the likelihood of somebody who 
was actually connected to Obama's mother and Obama himself early in their life, suddenly becoming the director of public health is uh, very, very remote. Yeah. Uh, this isn't like, you know, Baptists all over the world. And so the guy's a Baptist. No, this is a very, very fringe organization yeah. and that probably is, is very demonstrably connected to CIA. So anyway, so uh, another sorry, religious, a religious group. Sure that. And ju- just to interject here, not to derail the conversation early on, but this this is really interesting to me. I've I've interviewed uh, Peter Lavenda several times. He's a researcher and and uh, into the occult, and, and he points out that there are certain uh, ostensibly Christian organizations um, that that uh, that seem to appear at strange points in, in American history, like the Kennedy assassination. Uh, guys who like David Ferry and. Uh, Jack Martin uh, in, in New Orleans, who were wandering bishops, so-called wandering bishops of uh, something called the American Orthodox Catholic Church, uh, which had no connection to Roman Catholicism. But, uh, you know, suddenly you have these guys who, who uh, Lavenda refers to as wandering bishops who show up at strange events that are clearly intelligence operations. So this Sabud, which is, uh, as I understand it, an acronym for three Javanese words, ostensibly a religious organization. Yeah, with it, with together. A, with a, with a, with an office that just happens to be in Langley, Virginia, which is where CIA headquarters are located. Yeah, well, it's a, I think a mile apart, but anyway, it's they're close. And this Stanley Ann Dunham, who is ostensibly uh, Barack Obama's mother, uh, was also associated with that group uh, during her time in Indonesia. They, you might recall, they lived there for a while. <laughs> right, right. How coincidental. Uh, Stanley Ann Dunham married an Indonesian guy who had studied at the East-West uh, Institute in Hawaii, mm-hmm. was coincidentally well, and some of the only... closely related to the yeah. military and in his involvement. Hmm. And, and so by the way, way, some of the only pictures that we have of Obama in his early youth are of him playing guitar at Sabood uh, events and participating in Sabood events as a... Uh, you know, a uh, preteen. So to uh, put this in context, uh, this very, very tiny organization on the whole planet, one of their, if not, you know, senior U.S. member suddenly becomes the person who is um, fielding the uh, hits, the problems with the birth certificate in Hawaii. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty uh it's, it's a stretch to say that this just happened to occur as yeah. part of a plan yeah. wow hmm. and she was involved when then with uh barack obama's long form birth certificate and a number of other documents that kind of supported that uh, a verification by the state of arizona secretary of state for example and these things we have some reason to believe uh, were false uh, that as many document experts have looked at them, and uh, almost universally, people are saying uh, those were false. That's uh, certainly verified by Joe Arpaio, uh, Arizona uh, sheriff, very famous repute, and this cold case posse, which was working on that question for several years, I think five years or so before Joe was uh, elected out of office or unelected from that office. Right. Uh, but they, they too, came up with experts who uh, were able to say that that's certainly a fraud. Mm-hmm. And we concur with that and think there are other reasons to think so as well. But Loretta Fuddy was in on that uh, from the word go, and she was the one who had oversight over the department and probably would have had the ability to pull strings if that were necessary. And the strings and breadcrumbs that we see uh, in those false documents lead us to believe uh, that was her fingerprint involved. Hmm. Now, she was uh, ostensibly the mayor of a leper community that was managed by uh, the Hawaii Department of Health, and that's on the northern side of Molokai, which is a peninsula, five-square-mile area, that has this uh, secluded uh, place, a uh, town, if you will, Kalopapa, that uh, no one else could get to or can get to without a permit. You cannot go to that place except by mule or airplane. 
or boat, uh, but generally not. In any event, you need a permit, and uh, no one without a permit gets there. So that's true even today, even though the leper community is, is rather small compared to what it was uh, years ago. I believe it was uh, founded in 1866 or something like that. So it's been around for 150 years or so. Uh, but anyway, as the president of that, she had, or the, uh, I'm sorry, mayor of Kalopapa, she uh, had duties occasionally. And on an occasion of her being there, uh, after she was leaving from those duties but via airplane, this uh, crash happened. And uh, it's very unique. There were uh, an airplane with uh, eight paying passengers and a pilot. And very shortly after it took off, the pilot said he experienced, or the airplane experienced, a catastrophic engine failure, uh, and the engine stopped. And he had to put it down in the water because uh, it couldn't reach land again. Now, we've looked at those data that surround that and see that there's <clears throat> almost everything the pilot has said is not true. And the passengers, coincidentally, uh, go right along with that. But let me just close out your question with uh, regard to Loretta Fuddy. Mm -hmm. uh, she we understand and have the proof for exited that situation without, uh, without uh, any severe effects. Uh, she certainly didn't die as she was claimed to have. So that's a very important uh, difference. That is, she, uh, she was doing Barack Obama all these favors by falsifying documents. And of course, she's able then to live a uh, life after this event uh, probably with her feet in the sand and watching sunsets. And coincidentally, her family was able to resolve a couple of lawsuits uh, where they benefited tremendously. We don't have an official number, but we can be assured it was in the millions of dollars hmm. that uh, the manufacturer of the engine that supposedly failed in this event uh, paid them. So all this is well orchestrated so that uh, there's basically a reward for... Huh. Uh, doing favors for Barack Obama. Letting, letting things drop. So that's who Loretta Fuddy is, I would say. But the Rosetta Stone for this event, this being a Rosetta Stone for other things, is because of its multi-agency nature. That is, we have in this event, not simply a little commuter airline doing something, but we have the FAA is covering for this, the NTSB, the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Coast Guard, Hawaii county governments in Hawaii. And there's all kinds of coordination with these groups and agencies that show us what kind of corruption is deeply seated in these organizations. And people are able to keep quiet such that the citizenry of the United States doesn't hear about that. So watching how that well-oiled machine can work and these people coordinate with each other is hugely important to understand how the deep state uh, has control over these kinds of events and make, can make um, wizardry appear as just a normal event or an accident, a pure accident that hmm. uh, uh, well, requires a manufacturer of the engine to pay out money to people. Hmm. Let me, just, let me just chime in here a little bit too, uh, guys. In context, uh, the election was uh, still, uh, you know, a year plus off, and uh, Loretta Fuddy had done her uh, business with the birth certificate, then continued on as uh, the director, um, you know, uh, once she'd kind of put things in play, got the birth certificate in play. Uh, she was idling along in her job. There were some lawsuits and inquiries. There was the potential for some difficulty. And, uh, but more importantly, uh, was mission accomplished for the, for, you know, in, in most of what she could or would really need or be able to do. And so, uh, uh, she needed to be extricated, um, in part, you know, just by her age, she wanted to go have a life and probably didn't want to be director of public health forever. 
Um, and then she was the potential liability. Uh, she's hanging there. If any of these things did get traction, um, it might look more um, nefarious at some point for her to have a problem uh, if any of these things actually started to get some traction. So mm-hmm. it was mission accomplished. It was time to pull her out. And uh, this event conveniently did just that. And, uh, uh, you know, you don't have uh, a person to go after to uh, uh, interview. Right. So uh, that's that's kind of and, – and the other thing is, remember, what, what actually – caused the birth certificate to reemerge at the time that she came on the scene. It was Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Mr. Trump at the time uh, was uh, questioning the birth certificate. Remember around the country, we had these billboards that were beginning to get a lot of momentum on main highways around the company country. Where's the birth certificate? Right. Right. And so it was, uh, it had the potential to gain um, a lot of momentum, it was just starting to get momentum. So when Loretta Fuddy came on the scene, and, and, and also the, the uh, governor of Hawaii had famously claimed to be friends with the family and things like that, and then um, was uh, going to get to the bottom of this. And there had been a couple interviews where suddenly, gee, we looked everywhere, we can't find it. Uh, we can't find this birth certificate. And so she came in, uh, in a moment of crisis, the existing director of public health was forced out, uh, probably under some, uh, dress, uh, threats to his financial well-being with his, uh, uh his own practice and, and medical, uh, group with, uh, some billing improprieties to Medicare, or Medicaid, or some, silly thing. And, uh, so he bows out, she's immediately put in play and comes in to fix the situation and solve these problems, does the job, stays in the job, uh, till, you know, they know that it's mission accomplished. There's nothing more she can do. And Mm -hmm. then suddenly she's extracted from the situation by this death in a place that's extremely, remote where the department of public health controls the environment. Um, and you can't even go in there to look or, or have bystanders seeing something happen because they control that area completely. It might as well be in, in Antarctica or Mars. Hmm. It's that remote and isolated and sealed off from the public. Well, just to give it, uh, give a timeline. Anyway, sorry, I, it, it, you know. No, no, go, uh, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm, I'm Okay, I, I just just for just to recap very quickly the timeline of what's going on here. Uh, Loretta Fuddy was named the uh, acting director of the Hawaii Department of Health in January of 2011. That was confirmed. She was appointed the new director in March of 2011. Um, uh, w, you, you mentioned where's the birth certificate? That was actually the title of Jerome Corsi's book, which was published that spring, 2011. So this was all leading up to the 2012 election, and the questions are being raised by Mr. Trump, uh, by Jerome Corsi. Uh, of course, that was publicized by WND.com, which is a very popular news site, especially with conservatives. Um, Loretta Fuddy put into position. The uh, the crisis is averted. Obama is reelected. Uh, and uh, Fuddy, who was uh, 65 years old at the time for death in December of 2013, uh, one might think... Um, that because this has been a pattern you've seen in the past with people who participated in in some event that they regret uh, perhaps get to a point in their lives when they think I've got nothing left to lose so I might as well come clean and tell the truth and get this off my conscience but before I, I and we have no idea of knowing whether that was in her mind or, or heart at all but uh, uh, certainly her her untimely death um, eliminated that possibility as far as the deep state was concerned. Uh, now, Hugo, you mentioned that uh, she she survived the crash itself. Um, so her death yes, took place the sometime. that's story. Okay, so she, she, she died sometime well, after me, the plane. Let me add this. She, she was a, she was a died in the wool, not, she, she was not going to, uh, you know, Okay. Regret what she was doing. She she was a true believer. Is a true believer. If she's still out there somewhere, uh, you know, she's sworn in blood oath. She wasn't gonna. She wasn't gonna change. That she was a, a, a very key component in this. 
Um, and I, I will add to one thing we don't often hear, but uh, the co-author on the book, uh, uh, Nellie Restel, uh, a lot of the work that actually uh, was, you know, uh, helped us to get to the bottom of this whole burst and everything. I came from Nellie. Hmm. Um, long before the crash, uh, an event, she was one of the people helping ferret out some of this information because of her background in records and, uh, uh, records keeping. She had, had, uh, been, um, doing, uh, blog work, uh, in trying to expose, um, these improprieties with what was going on with the birth certificate, uh, prior to, uh, Loretta Fay's, uh, alleged death. So she, uh, we hear the other names, uh, with, uh, Arpaio and, and other people who had done work. Uh, Nellie was kind of, uh, unsung. Uh, she went by the, uh, internet name, Butter Dazillion. And uh, which was just kind of an inside uh, uh, fun thing amongst friends for the name she chose there. But she was really uh, very key and under threat because of it in what she was doing to expose the improprieties in this birth certificate. And, and, and that needs to be acknowledged yeah. and recognized within our uh, investigative community because she was not a bit part player. She was a significant uh, mainstream player in helping us to understand um, the magnitude of the lie that was mm -hmm. being foisted on uh, the public. And I should point out that uh, Doug Hagman of the Hagman Report in the interviews that uh, he conducted uh, with uh, Hugo in the past uh, was, was highly complimentary uh, of the uh, investigative work that went into all that and the, uh, the crash uh, to the point where Doug said he would to be willing to take the information at any court in the land and present it, uh, enter it into evidence. Uh, it is that meticulously researched. So um, I, I am coming to late to the party, I will admit, on, on um, talking with you gentlemen about this, uh, both uh, both of the Hagmans and uh, John B. Wells on his Caravan to Midnight program uh, talked about this uh, back in January. So uh, this isn't... Um, uh, it's sad to say we're not breaking news here, but I'm glad that uh, we can take some time to, to try to bring this to the attention of the public. Um, Hugo, the, the me, the, okay, go ahead. If I may, there's two little things. Uh, one is uh, it might have gone a little differently if back in 2011 uh, Donald Trump had gotten even more traction than he had because uh, – that was about the time that people were beginning to say, well, you know, who could we consider this guy for president? And it was just about that time, uh, as you might have noted, uh, April 27th of 2011, that uh, Barack Obama on television with great fanfare uh, introduced uh, to Savannah Guthrie and others uh, his long-form birth certificate. And that seemed to take the wind out of Donald Trump's sails a little bit. He no longer uh, made the claims as he did as strongly, even though the uh, question of whether he might eventually be a presidential candidate uh, continued. They did not kind of have the ramp up that they were having back in early uh, 2011. But also concomitant with that uh, in April of 2011, just after, that is four or five days after, as the birth certificate that was being presented was being roundly panned as uh, being false, and people were showing all kinds of problems like layers and and uh, fraudulent this and mm -hmm. uh, strange that, uh, African and blah blah blah. Uh, all of that was uh, growing as a as a uh, grassroots groundswell of uh, complaint that this there has to be something wrong with this. Well, five days later, guess what happens? Do you remember? Oh. The Osama bin Laden card gets played. Oh, that's right, that's right. And all of this is wiped off the the map. I mean, all the news reports, no time for any birth certificate discussion. And that Osama bin Laden card could have been played any time. You might recall there was discussion that Barack had turned that down uh, four or five times or something before that. Right, right. And just at that time. Now, why, why even mention that? Well, of course, for the news cycle thing, but there's a com commonality here as well that we believe the U.S. Navy SEALs were used in both of these situations 
to uh, <clears throat> actually propagandize the public. Wow. In the case of Osama bin Laden and in the case of uh, getting rid of uh, Loretta Fuddy. Hmm. And they, that was well, a and let me, let, me just, folks, let me just uh, let me just clean clean that up this just slightly. Uh, the SEAL team assets, at the very least, were in play in the Loretta Fuddy crash. Uh, let me add this too, because we won't have time in this interview to go into it. But uh, uh, Hugo did actually two long interviews on John Wells' show, and I believe those are available on the internet if you look for uh, uh, Hugo and John Wells. And so for those that want a blow-by-blow detailed description of uh, what occurred, that's also available there. And I mean, that's like uh, five and a half hours. Right. Yeah, first time John had ever done two back-to-back interviews with the same guest. And I only say that because we're we're trying to give your listeners a uh, a thumbnail sketch of what was in play. But if they want to actually understand this, and, and remember, this is about the president of the United States, right. the most powerful person, uh, arguably on the planet, at least from a political side, mm-hmm. and a huge scam was conducted, not just against the American people, but uh, the people of the whole world, in order to keep this person in power at a critical moment. And and what was it that he had to accomplish that those puppet masters behind the scenes had to have this guy in office to accomplish during this period from um, you know, let's say 2011 uh, to the end of his presidency. Yeah. What occurred there? Something that I have personally discussed uh, pretty extensively on the airwaves, which is Benghazi in the aftermath. What was Benghazi about? Benghazi was about the reshaping of the Mideast right. by covert action, mm-hmm. working in conjunction with the Muslim Brotherhood in order to change the governments in Egypt and Syria, right. uh, Libya, Tunisia, etc. This was about moving guns. This was a gun running operation up to Lebanon, Turkey, and Jordan Absolutely. in order to go after Assad. And this player, this person was pivotal in making sure that that happened. They, the powers behind this president had to have him there to complete this task and to get us into arguably this next conflict that we're close to now uh, that could very well eventually, uh, I would believe, end up in World War III. You know, uh, is it a military industrial thing? Well, military assets were used. So I come back to, is this SEAL team members actively participating in this, at the very least, military assets were used and in play in this fraudulent hoax of a death, a plane crash with Loretta Fuddy. Um, uh, Were SEAL team members directly the persons involved uh, in the water in this? Um, It may have been contractors. It probably was contractors. It probably was not active uh, SEAL team members, but certainly could have been because of uh, included in this, hey, there's a submarine that's assigned to the SEALs out of Hawaii, just so happens to be right there where the plane crash is, just a few miles offshore, exactly when this happened. There's aircraft overhead with the handle communications where the airspace has been closed for military activity directly above where this occurs at exactly this time window. Military assets were in play in order to pull off this hoax. And in my view, that's a militarization of the propaganda campaign against the American people in order to secure the results of an election uh, to keep a person in power. It's one thing when, uh, you know, they hire ad agencies and maybe they lie a little bit and there's a little collusion to, you know, get their guy in power. It's another thing when military assets 
are used in order to um, create, fabricate, and uh, institute a story, protect a story, um, aimed at putting somebody in office politically uh, here in the country and maintaining them in office. Mm -hmm. That is beyond any kind of, you know, thing that we can accept idly as citizens. And uh, that raises the bar to a level that we cannot be passive or complacent about. This is a very serious breach of protocols uh, uh, against the American public, the American voters. Mm. Well, let, let's uh, let's link this together then, because I, I agree with your assessment on what the uh, American government has been trying to accomplish, or the, rather elites through the American government have been trying to accomplish in the Middle East for at least the last 20 years. Um, they, they laid it out. Uh, in fact, uh, General uh, Wesley uh, uh, Clark uh, who very famously said that, uh, you know, laid out sort of a roadmap uh, that uh, that Iraq and Sudan and, and uh, Syria and then Iran eventually, you know, the path to Persia, if you will, was was sort of the, the, the game. And uh, just as we record this in early November of 2017, to time to tamp this for people listening to it in an archive some point in the future, uh, we're now seeing drums of war beating between uh, the Sunni and Shia powers in, in the Gulf. Saudi Arabia accusing Iran of being behind that missile that was fired at the airport in Riyadh last weekend. Um, wh- why, uh, Hugo, should we, when we look at the, uh, the FUDDY crash, the crash of this plane, and she was only one of nine passengers on board, um, why... Do you conclude with your three decades of aviation experience that the crash didn't occur the way the pilot explained it to the NTSB and the FAA? Yes, we looked closely at the NTSB report and what all they said and did and all of the evidence related to the technical uh, investigation of that incident call it a crash, I won't call it an accident, but we see that the NTSB is coming to all kinds of false conclusions. They're looking at the same evidence that uh, is clearly one way, and they call it the other. They repeat mindlessly what the pilot has said when the evidence is provably that the pilot is lying. So we've seen that in many, 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 many instances, and Mm -hmm. we can go through those as a litany, if you like, But we see that again and again, that the pilot makes this or that claim. Uh, The biggest one right off the bat is he claims that there was a catastrophic engine failure in the air and the engine stopped. Well, we have from five ways to Sunday evidence running. We hear that in audio that that we have uh, that was put on ABC News, for example. Mm -hmm. And here I can play that. it was, I believe, Robin Wright on uh, Good Morning America. And you can hear in the background as they're playing the video, we hear the engine running. Here it is. Those passengers don't know it yet. Those passengers don't know it yet. Did you hear in the background, the engine is running. Mm-hmm. Well, that's roughly 10 seconds after the uh, supposed catastrophic engine failure. And yet, uh, even though the pilot says it stopped, it's still running. Now, we don't hear a propeller sound in that, but that sound is over 15,000 RPM. That's the uh, signature, if you will, of that engine's running. And if we listen to some of the raw audio from that, we hear, without the narration, a rise in the RPM, and then a descent, a descending RPM. So listen to this for a few seconds. Well, actually, let me set this up a bit, that there were people on board who said everything went quiet after this catastrophic engine failure. And then uh, after a few seconds, the um, engine appears to start again. Well, that's not part of the official story. Uh, It never happened that way. And what we're going to hear in this particular segment is that indeed, Everything seems to go quiet. All one hears is the rustling of the uh, videographer for a few seconds, six seconds. And then, as if on a switch, one hears 
an engine running. Now, that's not the way physics works. This is uh, an engine that takes many seconds to spool up and come to speed before it's 15,000 plus RPM. But we hear it as if it's on a switch. So we know that this audio has been doctored. Hmm. Here it is. What you heard there was about six seconds of rustling at the videographer's seat. Then, as if on a switch, the engine appears, and then it rises as RPM, and then it comes back down as RPM. So those are physically impossible. The engine cannot start that way. And furthermore, the pilot says he tried, even though he tried to make two engine restarts, they were both unsuccessful. So how he gets it apparently smoothly running such that it rises in RPM and comes back down, Hmm. that's not what he said. And frankly, the way it starts is a physical impossibility, which I've verified with uh, uh, pilots of this particular aircraft, the Cessna Grand Caravan. So all of these show uh, falsification, and it's highly distressing. I mean, the NTSB we trust, to do honest investigations, and if that weren't the case, we could have all kinds of problems on the uh, aviation safety and otherwise transportation landscape. So this is um, tremendously important. If uh, the NTSB is falsifying things, oh my goodness, uh, nothing is safe. And indeed, uh, my personal opinion would be that this uh, manufacturer of the engine in this situation has been falsely accused, has had to pay settlements to at least two different lawsuits that were brought in Hawaii with regard to this uh, crash. Hmm. But anyway, listen to this next video or audio segment where you'll hear over uh, right after the person talks about uh, the plane is about to crash, you'll hear a change in RPM. And that certainly sounds like a uh, reduction in the um, power lever. Listen to this. Plane is about to crash. Plane is about to crash. Could you hear that? Yeah, the, there? the yeah the change in the 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 pitch of the the background noise. It it it, it definitely yes, exactly exactly that. And then so we know that's been edited, or it's you know it shows something. Here uh, we have the moments, probably uh, a few hundred milliseconds. Actually, there's a little longer to clip, but nonetheless, uh, in a few hundred milliseconds, just as the aircraft is crashing into the water, the RPM changes again. And we can hear that very clearly right after it hits the water. Hear that. So, come on, guys. I thought you said the engine stopped. Well, yeah. that did not happen. So, uh, and that's a smooth sound that, that we heard throughout, especially at that earlier one. Those are smooth engine sounds. Now, if we look at the NTSB report, they said there was an intense internal fire and that uh, several of the compressor fan blades, uh, both the compressor and, well, it started out with the compressor fan blades, uh, left their uh, mooring inside the the fan blade or inside the compressor and contacted the shroud and proceeded to wipe out uh, large parts of all of the blades in both the compressor and power section of that engine. And there was a fine uh, metallic dust that coated the uh, blades that they examined and they saw the melting, literally, and that all that bespeaks a severe catastrophic engine failure, just, just as was claimed. However, the point is they did not examine the engine that was ditched. Oh, we have proof of that. So, oh, well, let me ask. Let me ask very quickly. A little quickly, bit of a twist. Let, let me ask very quickly. Uh, where did the uh, the evidence, the audio, uh, come from? Who, who recorded this? Very good. I'm glad you asked. Uh, there was a videographer on board, a person who was into free diving, who uh, had two GoPros uh, with him. 
Mm, uh, okay. Coincidentally, now they were, you know, they're both operational. We have to presume he charged the battery on them and so forth, which are good for an hour and a half. But anyway, he only provided, or we have only as a result through the NTSB, some 18 minutes or so of his video and audio, which comes in two segments. One is the pre, uh, the pre, uh, pre catastrophic engine failure, supposedly. So it essentially includes the taxi from the uh, airport apron uh, to the runway, the takeoff, and then uh, some half minute or so after the takeoff, um, he actually claims to turn off his video. And then this within seconds, he claims, uh, the catastrophic engine failure came as a bang that everybody heard, everybody reported to the FAA. However, he, he then turns the video back on and continues rolling until his batteries ran out, hmm. says he. But that only supposedly amounted to 18 minutes worth of video. We know there are gaps in that. We can prove that as well. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's why we have audio for this event. It comes directly from that uh, video that was recorded by the uh, videographer. Hmm. Interesting. Um, and so, even uh, more interesting that there are pieces missing. Yeah. Prove that... Uh, the pilot and others were lying about uh, their representations about what happened. And uh, one of the big ones is, is, for example, what the pilot has said to the FAA. He uh, claimed to the FAA that the, uh, that the accident happened uh, at 300 feet as he was rounding the turn for Honolulu. And let me ask you, we'll tell you to pull up uh, JPEG 32, which shows a top-down view of the uh, of the crash site, and what it has is the aircraft taking off on Kalopapa's runway five, which is to the northeast, and it has an arrow and a tracing there, and it shows the arc where he would have turned toward Honolulu, which is essentially directly west of the Kalopapa Airport. And that's marked on the image with a big red X. Okay. We have verification of that location, uh, which we see in image, and I'll see if I can pull it up here, yes, uh, 25. Image 25 shows uh, over the right shoulder of the videographer the uh, northeast edge of the Molokai mountain range, cliff range uh, on the north side. And that comports precisely with uh, what the pilot said. Uh, one of the few things that did comport with it, that is, uh, he was rounding the turn for Honolulu. And uh, he claims at that point to have been at 300 feet. However, we have quite uh, a lot of proof showing that he was uh, at or above 1,000 feet. Hmm. Um, so instead of being at 300 feet, he was... Uh, in the range of a thousand feet, uh, actually, there are two uh, two reports from passengers, which use the identical words and say the aircraft was between a thousand and fifteen hundred feet. So there's internal. And, and this passenger... is an important point because this is an important point, uh, folks. Because if he was at a much higher altitude, he could easily have made a return uh, a glide back to the runway and didn't have to ditch in the water. Uh, his location when this supposed engine failure happened uh, is uh, an essential part of the story. Uh, the reality is uh, there was no need to ditch in the ocean uh, uh, as occurred. And, and uh, it goes back to this controlled uh, water landing that actually occurred. And let me just add this, why this particular pilot? Um, there's real questions, valid questions, about who this individual actually is from an experience level. Uh, and uh, he, uh, amongst other things in his repertoire, uh, uh, flew an aircraft for air races. So this is a guy that uh, wasn't just uh, a average commercial uh, pilot um, doing this 
this or even a low hour commuter uh, airline pilot with his hours, uh, his age, his expertise level, um, uh, it would be probably very unusual to be at this backwater uh, airline flying this type of aircraft, given his history. But Mm -hmm. the reality is he was the guy because he had a, um, uh, he, he had the skill sets to, uh, fly, uh, and do this, uh, unusual water landing, uh, put it on the numbers and get it down intact safely, if you will, uh, to concoct this ruse. So, uh, so the, the location, uh, the, the location of where he landed was, was significant then? I mean, th- there was a reason for him to land well, at that particular absolutely. point? Absolutely. Yes, yes. And let me just add that this was the director of operations for a uh, small, successful airline uh, with many pilots they had working for them. And he's taking this run, which to Kalokapapa and back should have been normally done by a $15 an hour kind of pilot. (laughs) And yet this is the director of operations doing this one. So that's pretty unusual. But if we go back to uh, image 32 and look at that, the top-down view, we see in blue the line that would indicate uh, if you've lost your engine and you're having to glide down to uh, the ocean, uh, where you would take it. Now, we know at that altitude that he had uh, that he should have easily been able to make it to the runway. In fact, there's a tailwind at that point, giving him 15 knots of push, which should have uh, made it not only possible, but easily to the runway. And we can see that. Now there's a marking there, it shows the D. We know that is where the aircraft indeed ditched. So why would the pilot accept a uh, tailwind of 15 knots uh, to land at that particular place? Now, normally a pilot will down his aircraft only into the wind and indeed trading off 30 knots worth of wind that is instead of having uh, 15 knots of tailwind you have 15 knots of headwind that would slow your aircraft down so that what whatever you hit when you touch down is going to come at you uh, 30 knots slower than otherwise right right so that's tremendously important there's not a pilot over 500 hours who would ever do this kind of maneuver and yet we're to believe that's what he did, that he, that he had a catastrophic failure at X. And this 18,000-hour pilot uh, puts his aircraft down, uh, supposedly downwind at that location. Well, no. So, so, so the, blue, fact, the blue line, he, just to clarify, the blue line then shows what he told the NTSB and the FAA, that he just basically allowed the wind to push him and, and, and followed that path to point D where he ditched, rather than what the evidence suggests he did, which is follow the red line and then circle back around the yellow path. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, That is, he supposedly had no power and was unable to make the field were his two claims. Right. But he did have that. And it implies that we know that the blue line arrowed, whatever it was, not what he took, but that's what his story does imply. Okay. Now, we know that that D is where he landed, but the yellow arc that has out on the water and coming into that D is what he actually did. But that also implies these two facts, that he was starting at, we'll say, 1,000 feet, and he the second portion of the video starts at about 255 feet. So he's moved about three-quarter mile, and lost about 750 feet in altitude. Hmm. But in doing so, he's turning away from the airport. Mm -hmm. Now, there's just no way in the world that that should be what a person would do. You would want to make the airport so you'd have a safe landing for all of your paying customers. But he goes out, and we are told that it's just a few seconds that the videographer had his video off. But we know that's not true. It must have been um, at least you know, the greater part, the majority of a minute, if not much longer. It's quite possible it might have been several minutes. But anyway, uh, 
nonetheless, he picks up his, uh, the, the videographer picks up the second portion of the video at that point um, within some number of yards. It's not precise, but it's, it's relatively correct. We know that they were in a gentle left bank the entire way, and we know that uh, the aircraft was pointed into the sun, which was probably a, a, a marker that he uh, had practiced. That is, if we look at, uh, let's see which uh, image that is. Oh, yes, uh, image 27. That's the first, uh, in the first second of video for the second portion. Uh, we see uh, in the right image the sun's rays coming in just on the edge of that uh, window. That means, if you follow where the sun is going, mm -hmm. as you can see on the overhead map on the left, that he's headed into the sun at that point, which is very different from where he left at the red X, where the sun's rays were literally coming in at a roughly 90-degree angle right. to the uh, airplane. So we know that takes a number of seconds. And with the other features of height and distance where that video starts, we know that he's uh, repositioned the aircraft with respect to the sun, with respect to altitude and orientation. So he's lied about all of that. The videographer has lied about that. And we see that arc out from the water and landing very near uh, the, the shore there. We've measured that. Uh, we have Google can help us measure things like that. We have imagery. If we look at image 87, we see from the water's point of view, out over the water where that aircraft came to rest, and it's rather close to the shoreline. In fact, we've measured it, for example, with uh, not only Google Maps, but also with uh, replications of the wingspan of that aircraft, and that can be seen in image 144, and it shows that it has its uh, 13 and a half uh, wingspans from shore, mm -hmm. and that translates to 702 feet or 234 yards. And the upper left map in 144 shows you uh, the bathymetry map that was included in the NTSB report. And right near where the plane came down, there's an area marked on that map as being only one meter deep. Oh, okay. And there's another area just uh, to the south of that that shows outcroppings of the ocean floor, mm -hmm. also very close to that area. Now that image on the right of that 144 image shows you uh, the satellite view from top down on a different day, mind you, but it shows uh, these little uh, eddies and currents that surround the area where the ocean floor literally comes up out of the water hmm. at that point. So this is a very shallow area, and even though the constant depth uh, line on the bathymetry map upper left shows four and a quarter at that line, which would translate to roughly 18 feet or so, 17 feet, mm -hmm. um, that tells you that this is a shallow area, and we have uh, images throughout that show and suggest that uh, the people are able to stand. If we look momentarily here uh, at, let's see, oh, number 97, for example, image 97 with life jackets, mm -hmm. we see at the lower right, one of the passengers' uh, life jacket isn't touching the water at all. Right. Similarly, in, in the upper middle picture, he's not touching the water at all. If we look at the image labeled Poseidon, you see that the guy is apparently standing. He's got a, a no life jacket foot and at all. Half of his body, yeah, foot and a half of his body out of water. There. If we look at the image of ninety nine, we see uh, the assistant to Loretta Fuddy in the middle of that image, and his life jacket is barely touching the water, and his shoulders are clearly out of the water. Now we have other images of him when he's. Uh, clearly resting on that life jacket, and it's just as you would expect. Uh, even in the lower portion of that image, uh, uh, it's 
Well, that's not a good example because there, too, he's out of the water. But uh, let me see if I've got one where they're uh, literally resting on the water. Um, well, anyway, it, for the moment, trust me, it, it, there's, you'll see the life jacket is fully in contact with the water. So it's a clear difference that anyone could note. Mm-hmm. So those things were going on, and we see the airplane actually tipped. If we look at image 57 for a moment, uh, you can see that the airplane, as it came to rest, was tipped uh, for, from the, uh, the left wing. The port wing was up out of the water, not touching and probably as high as 10 feet on the far side. Mm-hmm. And the lower wing is to the right, the starboard uh, wing. And you can see that in the larger image uh, at right, where the right wing is down. Mm-hmm. If you look at the upper left image, you'll see that the windows on the right side of the airplane are lower than the window on the far side of the airplane. Right, so right. that's a further indication of this tipping Again, then the guy behind or underneath the tail uh, without a life jacket, uh, mm-hmm. doing just fine without having to uh, thrash and swim and so forth. He's just literally standing there. Mm-hmm. So let, let, me, let me jump in here and, and, and the point here, the, the point here is that the aircraft was ditched in water so shallow that the landing gear is on the bottom it's impacted into the floor, deflected the floor, actually caused, it, caused the only real injury on the aircraft uh, from, the, from the water landing, which was a passenger whose seat was uh, pushed up into the, uh, uh, from the floor up uh, and, and caused an injury. Um, this plane didn't land as they initially tried to fool us in some of the roughest water on the planet you know, thousand feet of water, et cetera. They, they tried to initially say that the aircraft would be unrecoverable because it was, uh, you know, in this horrible, horrendous, high current, uh, heavy wave action water. The reality is they landed in water that you and I would go out and uh, bounce around in and relax uh, uh, if we were going off the beach to enjoy a day in Hawaii uh, in the sun. Yeah. And uh, they, uh, this was, you know, bath water. Uh, uh, they could easily have gotten to shore. Uh, uh, a baby swimmer could have got to shore from this location. This exact ditching location was picked for a reason because they wanted to concoct a, uh, a story and they had this videographer prepped and ready to go to document it. You know, it was a month after the crash before he even disclosed that he had video oh. all this time after the crash, we're never going to know what's happened suddenly out of the blue because people are questioning what's going on here to cement the story. Then miraculously he shows up with the video and uh, with, with pieces this, missing. Yeah. This was orchestration. And, and, and the reason that I, let me just jump in here. Cause you know, just like we did, you know, over five hours with uh, John Wells, we could bog down on the minutia um, but I think we have to kind of catapult forward through a lot of this. The reality is it's a, it's a manufactured event with a skilled pilot. Uh, the guy shooting the video is a free uh, diver that's, you know, goes down, you know, uh, hundreds of feet, if you will, uh, on just a breath of air in competitions. Hmm. Um, uh, other people on the airplane each have certain skill sets. Uh, in fact, we even see what appears to be a dummy in the aircraft to simulate stuff. Uh, one of the passengers clearly has a jacket that can be inflated into a life vest, and he's wearing it as though it's just casual clothing on the plane because uh, he's guaranteeing he's not going to expire in this in this theatrical event. Um, uh, further on in this event, we see divers in the water in this video that clearly could not have been people from the airplane. We mm-hmm. see extra people in the water, and we even see uh, uh, a, a vehicle, uh, which is a SEAL team-type vehicle, clearly in the video in just a handful of frames uh, that accidentally got uh, in there that didn't get edited out. Um, a SEAL team-type uh, vehicle? What, what, sort of, diver, what sort of vehicle are you, uh, you talking about? 
a, a driver transportation vehicle, which is an underwater uh, sled, if you will, mm-hmm. to move personnel covertly. And this type of a vehicle is deployed from uh, a submarine that can either have a wet or a dry enclosure uh, mounted to it. And just so happens that uh, conveniently the one sub in the area that has that capability to deploy a diver transportation vehicle, an underwater sled, if you will, just so happens to be a couple miles offshore as this event is happening. And we have that in records from the Navy proving that that vehicle was there. This isn't just a uh, educated guess or, uh, you know, we're, we're out in conspiracy, you know, Lulu land. So, and we uh, see why lots of other, uh, yes, lots of other uh, things. Uh, well, and so let me just, let me just put it this way. Um, in fact, uh, if you could pull up the picture of the fish for me personally, the, the one piece of evidence beyond the diver transportation vehicle, which lost, uh, 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 it left neutral buoyancy and became visible in a few frames of the video, mm-hmm. um, beside the aircraft, uh, this electronic fish, which is a communication, uh, uh, is there in the video. That's not natural. That's not photoshopped. That's nothing. That's in the video. The NTSB has the video that was broadcast, uh, uh, on the evening news there. That's in the video. That is not natural. That is not something that came off the plane. That is a very sophisticated, but coyly disguised communications device. Um, sort of, you know, mimicking a fish, but it's, it's obviously man-made. Why is that there? Because we believe it would have been part of an underwater network. A communication that would have been, in fact, we see several things in, in these photographs, in these video extracts that are part of an underwater communications system so that the divers can communicate as they're pulling off this, you know, visual fraud. And in fact, what's directly overhead as this is going on, a communications aircraft, a a relay, if you will, for those people that would have been watching this. So a manufactured event highly choreographed with military assets and very possibly military personnel, or at the very least contractors utilizing those military assets uh, is present in this video. And, and why was this video released to the public? They were trying to convince us because a lot of people in the public, uh, uh, in the not mainstream media were questioning the convenience of Loretta Fuddy being the sole death in this plane crash. So this was supposed to cement for us that, you know, nothing here, move along. Uh, it's all exactly as we said. And, and, and how could you, you know, possibly question this when, when here's the video of, of the horrible event as it happened and these people in a desperate life and death struggle, it's Hollywood. And mm. in fact, even the other aircraft were calling in, uh, and communicating about this. Who are they? They're Hollywood people. Hmm. Tell them about that, uh, Hugo. I mean, it, this is a Hollywood event intended to yes, propaganda uh, us into believing this fraud. Hmm. Coincidentally, the owner of the airline and the first on the scene pilot, who ostensibly had no connection to one another but actually did very much, were both involved with two different television series and flying helicopters for that those series. One was Lost, <laughs> and the other was Hawaii Five O. <laughs> they were both working together. They both flew in that particular airline's helicopters. Uh-huh. So even though this pilot supposedly comes out of his no, nowhere with a girlfriend beside him, he's actually a friend of the airline owner who's flown in. Uh, that particular airline's helicopters uh, for years. So where they have the cover of uh, uh, coincidence, supposedly, uh, no, it's all planned, and obviously they would have had to know ahead of time. And what that 
a random first on the scene pilot is able to read into the record, of course, just comports with the desired official narrative, but actually is is not in many ways. Hmm. Well, uh, and well let, me, let me just jump forward because we could get bogged down a lot of this, but let me just jump right. forward and, and say this also. Uh, the entire event is is staged. Once you uh, have looked at the evidence, that's incontrovertible, uh, I think, for any reasonable person, even at the outer fringes where you're highly doubting that somebody would want to do this or could do this or pull it off. I think a reasonable person looks at it and goes, oh my gosh, it's, it is clearly fraudulent. This is mm-hmm. a staged event. But what are the implications of that? Right, right. Because remember, who all had to agree to stay in there with this lie. You have NTSB Mm -hmm. people at the NTSB who in looking at this easily could see that the evidence was falsified or not uh, jiving. Uh, They looked the other way. And in fact, they add to the falsification because one of the key events here, why were these, these divers in the water? What were they doing when the plane was later recovered? the engine was detached from the airframe and they attributed this to a storm that had happened in those few days. Initially they weren't going to recover this supposedly, but Mm -hmm. then suddenly they decided they're going to recover. it. So they find this uh, engine and the airframe uh, separate. Let me just tell you, because I have uh, involvement in, in uh, high speed vehicles and uh, uh, aircraft The strongest area of the airplane is where the engine attaches to the frame. You'd hope so. Those components are designed to stretch, to twist, to do all sorts of things, but not to detach. Uh, The amount of force required to detach an engine from an airframe, uh, you know, you'd have to get a telephone pole sideways at 500 knots. And it'd have to be, uh, uh, you know, able to slice and dice. That'd be take more than a telephone pole to do it, probably. But at the end of the day, that's the strongest part of the aircraft, and yet it's detached from the aircraft. What did we find when we start looking at this? First of all, the divers are there using what appears to be cutting equipment, underwater demolition equipment, cutting that engine off the aircraft. Why? Because the engine is the evidence when the plane went in the water, certain things would happen internally to the engine if it was running. If the engine wasn't running when it hit the water, then it would have different types of evidence. Sure. So when they decided to recover the aircraft and the engine separate from the airframe, the people on the barge, uh, and this is something that Corsi uh, uh, had somebody that uh, uh, was apparently a witness of this, they picked up two engines is what it appears. <laughs> and that would make sense based on what we're seeing. On a single they engine plane. Two engines, it's, it's a one engine airplane. Yeah. <laughs> and I well, noticed in one of the photos, we yeah, I'm kind of trying to there pull were multiple engines, engines in there, but I think it's necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Beca- because, uh, and, 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 and so Hugo, you, let me just say this, <clears throat> go ahead and, and tell them, Hugo, just so they get a few of these images in there, how do we know that engine was cut away, that it, it had to be cut yeah. manually, yeah. not as a result of the crash? That's part of the most yeah. important evidence in this case because the NTSB tried to obscure the photographs that clearly show very uh, powerful machine uh, cuts were made to the uh, – uh, areas where the engine would connect, you know, there's hoses, there's metal pipes, uh, 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 coolant lines, etc. that you couldn't just go there with a hacksaw and easily cut. These are very hard to cut types of components right, and right. they're um, cut uh, with very complex pieces of equipment. There is zero reason why on that barge, the engine should look uh, the way that it is, or engines, um, and that can only come because somebody was trying to uh, uh, conceal evidence and provide evidence uh, uh, that wasn't correct. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Derek, you'll want to have bring up image 128 probably a good bit earlier in the conversation okay. as, as W was describing it, so they'll get a chance to look at that image there. 
But uh, we also see that the uh, NTSB has falsified their report, literally showing uh, evidence that was altered, which is just an incredible uh, thing to have to say. If we look at, uh, let me see what image that is. Um, well, uh, we'll one, get one that's close to that. That is image uh, 127. It shows the two different engines. One is still under the water, and one is the one that was pulled up on the barge. The one on the barge has uh, three propeller blades that are still in the propeller disc plane. That is, they're turning around in the same plane as they would when they're uh, uh, turning normally or powering the aircraft. Mm -hmm. But in the underwater aircraft, the one that ditched, the propeller was feathered, and we can see that because the lowest propeller blade was bent back severely uh, to contact literally or uh, very close to if not exactly uh, that nose gear strut that comes down below so that one blade because it was the first to hit and it was the airplane the propeller was not turning it got bent back the most while that upper blade shows almost no bending at least as we can see from the image so that shows the propeller blades were differentially bent in this event, mm -hmm. showing that the prop was not turning. But if you look at the engine on the left, you say, which of those blades is that lowest blade from the right picture? Mm -hmm. Well, it can't be any of them. None of them, right. Because it, it, it does, a propeller is so beefy, and there's just no rolling around on the rocks that would ever bend it back so that it could possibly be... Uh, any of those that are shown on the left. So that's um, a big part of the problem here. Um, if we look at image 129, we see uh, two things. It's not the best picture for the back of the engine, but at the upper left is the back of the engine. It's the only picture uh, in the whole series that has the back of the engine, and it's fuzzed up. It's literally been Photoshopped. And I'll get you the better image uh, for your post-production right. dropping in. But in the lower, in the upper left, there, the, there's a rectangular box around the uh, a propeller paint uh, on one of the blades. Mm -hmm. uh, we call that the blade tip paint pattern. And you can see that's the only blade tip paint in that we see in the. But actually, that's been falsified, and we could go at length to exactly explain why. But the long and the short is those other two images, the larger images at right and below, are other pictures of that very same propeller blade, and it shows the original paint pattern of those, and it's very different, which show that the NTSB or someone working in conjunction with the NTSB has literally falsified that piece of evidence. So... Uh, why they would do so is because it would more closely match the underwater images we have of uh, the blades on that particular plant, uh, plane, the one that ditched. Mm -hmm. And an image that would show that, uh, let me see if I can find it for you. Yeah, uh, image 42 shows the difference between the images of the engine blade that was brought up on the barge and the images of the engine uh, or the propeller blades from underwater. And those show a wider black area between the two white stripes for the barge image than the ones that came from underwater. And it tells us confirmingly that there were two different engines because there were, those were two different propellers. Mm. So we have at, uh, at least three different ways that there are differences uh, that show there's two engines, and we have the NTSB literally falsifying the evidence or letting the evidence be falsified so that we're made to believe that they, they were the same propeller blade paint when they weren't because I, in fact, had a conversation with the investigator in charge and I apprised him that this proved that there were two engines. So uh, I think that was probably the motivation that uh, brought them to do that. And whoever it was, we went over earlier that uh, falsification of the 
a silent six seconds at the beginning of the uh, 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 recording or the second portion after the supposed catastrophic engine failure. That is a another falsification of the data, whoever did it. Mm-hmm. And uh, it had to comport with the evidence that actually three different witnesses told the Maui police. They all used exactly the same wording. What a coincidence to say everything went quiet. That was a phrase in all of their testimony. Hmm. All of the people who spoke to the police used that very same phrase. And if the evidence would suggest that it didn't ever go quiet, maybe that would be a problem. So I think that might have been a motivation for them making that change. So we have three different ways very clearly that the evidence has been falsified. So not only do they come to false conclusions, and that's really why I went into some of that, uh, all of this detail that W talked about, that is to show that it's not just us waving hands and saying, oh, this is a conspiracy or something like that. No, this literally detail after detail after detail after detail that the NTSB cannot seemingly get right. And these are people who are the cream of the crop. They do not make these kind of mistakes. Mm. And if you look at image 108, for example, you see the last image before touching down on the water. And it has the plane in the left bank. It has the nose low. It has this airplane in a situation that no pilot would ever knowingly do. And that had to be for an unusual reason, which I can only throw my head at. But the proof is in the image there. They touched down the water in a way that the NTSB says was completely different. The NTSB's writing says it landed uh, uh, wings level onto the water and slightly nose-up attitude, if not flat. Here it is. It says, landed within open ocean water in a flat or nose-up attitude. Well, they had this image right before before them. They could have seen that. Hmm. This is Hmm. false. It wasn't the open ocean. It wasn't flat. It was nose down. They said it was slightly nose up attitude. Hmm. All of these things are false, and any person can look at the evidence and see otherwise. So why would they have put false statements in their report? And it had to comport with well. Well, let me let me jump in here. The the import here is this. In our observation, it's readily, easily provable that the NTSB's report is falsified and is uh, concocted in many ways uh, with photoshopping, etc. We wouldn't be having this conversation if we didn't have the video and the stills that we've extracted from the video. Uh, Somewhere in here, somebody thought they were doing a Hollywood production and they needed to um, have this as a backup and they played this card. Had we not had the video, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation because we would have to accept the statements of the various people um, at face value. Uh, I think that the players involved overreached in trying to prove their story and to quiet down any potential critics. And when they overplayed their hand, they gave us uh, uh, tools, uh, material that um, can prove the fraud of this crash uh, in ways that maybe other events we, we can speculate at, but we just don't have enough stuff to work with to prove otherwise. In this case, we do. It's, you know, out there. It's not going away. It's in the history books. Uh, they've revealed uh, their hand uh, too much. Now, why is that important for us now? Right, right. That's the key what question. What was the point in doing this whole thing? Listen, what kind of power does it take to get the National Transportation Board Experts, professionals, guys with the career, guys with the reputation who want to preserve their reputation by doing um, great work and that others could look at their work and critique and say, hey, that's that doesn't work. That's that's BS like we're doing right now. Huh. What's it take to cause guys to uh, 
uh, do something false like this? Where does the power come from and how great is the power to cause uh, investigators like this to uh, provide a lying report? And not just the NTSB. Uh, this also occurred at the local level with the police department and the fire department there in Maui County. This occurred with state officials. This occurred with FAA officials. These people have all participated in a knowing lie. And who can pull the strings that broadly and deeply? Uh, what is the level of, I'll just say it, corruption going on here? This is of uh, uh, unacceptable in our society. And if these, these, uh, this type of corruption can stand, then we cannot have honest elections and a honest chance for the citizenry to uh, uh, supervise their government because right. we are being lied to using government assets to manufacture and then perpetrate a lie in order to cause us to make certain decisions, take certain actions that support one particular group. And um, uh, it goes to the integrity of our government um, of we the people. We are being propagandized using our own federal agencies. How can individual citizens hope to control their government when the whole weight and power of the federal machine is engineering falsehoods against the people, perpetrating these lies to get you to act certain ways, accept certain things, uh, uh, vote a certain way, because this was about maintaining the outcome of a vote mm -hmm. and uh, maintaining the perspective of the people about this person who was kept in office as a result of this whole birth certificate thing, etc. cetera. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Clint Eastwood said it, I thought, very well. He said, you know, when the history books are written, and I'm paraphrasing slightly, but uh, when the history books have written, the American people will realize that this was the most fraudulent presidency ever perpetrated on the American people. That this entire presidency is just one big fraud from one end to the other. Let me ask you this, and we just have a few minutes left because I'm under some time constraints today as far as... Um how much uh, how much longer we can go here uh say with just a few minutes left uh and, and i will in the show notes uh, for the benefit of listeners and viewers who want to go deeper into this uh link to the interviews done previously uh by hugo fugan with uh joe and doug hagman and uh, john b wells so that you can uh, uh you know take advantage of what they've already done uh rather than waiting for us to do another interview and hopefully we can do this again um, but just just to get your sense, uh, Hugo and the W, uh, what what is the, the the net effect here? I mean, what, what um, wh where where are we now in America as a result of the the fuddy crash? I mean, uh, and, and I, I guess by that I mean, has the Donald Trump presidency how has that affected what the elites behind engineering the the fraud? Of the funny cra yeah. the well, funny crash. We're looking okay. at, a, at a snapshot in time three years ago where this was the case, but even though Donald Trump may be president, uh, we don't believe that the people who pulled the strings for this have any less power really than they did at this time. There's right, been right. No investigation by the FBI, uh, so there's no reason to uh, to understand that that's been changed. Uh, that needs to be done. We need an honest investigation. What the NTSB has done needs to be put aside and uh, re it needs to be reinvestigated. The people who were corruptly plying their hand in this need to be asked the questions so that we find the person who gave the order for these kinds of things. All that needs to be done before these things can be fixed. Mm -hmm. And let me just add one. Well, and let me, let me jump in here. My my concern is this, you know, we have an alleged death. Uh, there is no statute of limitations right. on murder. 
uh, if this was a staged event and she did in fact die, uh, she died as a result of this uh, theater that they were doing. We don't believe she died at all. Okay, that was the question I was um, going to ask, because you'd used the phrase alleged death earlier on, and I realized I had let that thread kind of hang out there. So I'm glad you're addressing this now, W. So uh, what, what uh, uh, if then, is she she complicit in all of this? Uh, again, um, <laughs> what, is, what does this mean for the, for the country in which we live? Well, again, uh, you know, here we can say, uh, as far as I'm concerned, conclusively, that this was a manufactured uh, event in order to perpetrate a fraudulent uh, scenario onto mm-hmm. the American public and the world, really, in order to maintain a specific individual in his office, which is Barack Obama, as the president of the United States, without him having his authority uh, questioned or undermined Um, based on, you know, this person, uh, the birth certificate, et cetera, or even the alleged crash. And so we were, uh, this was to maintain a political situation where they could work with uh, impunity, continuing on probably with their Mideast operations to Mm -hmm. uh, uh, go after Syria and and, uh, uh, take out Assad. But... If that's the case, and uh, all of these federal assets are used, those people aren't elected to office uh, for the most part. Uh, uh, The the, uh, correct body to investigate a death in this type of situation is actually the FBI. uh, uh, If if this was a fraudulent event, which we say it is, um, without any reservation, then the FBI should be uh, investigating, uh, the NTSB should be handing the material over to the FBI to do a criminal investigation of what uh, transpired here. Um, Mm. With that in mind, they're very politicized over there also. And so the question is, um, can we get to honest investigations? And with these players that transcend uh, administrations of uh, Democrat or Republican, that is the deep state that we're talking about. These people uh, down through the ranks that were involved in um, maintaining this fraud uh, against the American people are still there. That's a threat to this current administration. That is a threat to President Trump, who was one of the people trying to uh, question or bring out uh, into the public conversation um, this whole birth certificate matter. So uh, this is a threat because uh, this is war at the deep state level. And I say war very precisely, not just in a trivial sense, because military assets were in play in this event Mm -hmm. in order to perpetrate the propaganda, the fraud of this being a legitimate airplane crash with the death of this individual. Mm. If you have military assets, militarized propaganda against the American people, that is something that we cannot allow to stand. And I will add, by the way, there is a component of this that goes back to extortion 17 and the death of those seals in that event who had knowledge of what actually occurred in this alleged death of bin Laden in that uh, uh, event in uh, Pakistan. About about, yeah. So both of these actually work together hmm. uh, because, again, the SEAL team assets were in play and military assets were in play um, in, in all of these events. And we believe, in fact, in a real investigation that we will find persons involved in the military who uh, were complicit in orchestrating both events for the same purpose, keeping this person, Barack Obama, in office, uh, uh, you know, in these, you know, concocted staged events to, to protect the narrative. Hmm. 
can't be allowed to stand. Mm. We need honest investigations. And that's where President Trump could allow these investigations request uh, and Congress also uh, could demand um, that these cases be reopened. Uh, a simple reopening of the NTSB's investigation followed up by FBI uh, investigation where appropriate for the criminal aspects, both of the cover up inside the NTSB. There is an FBI uh, need authority of uh, legal authority uh, need to investigate the goings on at NTSB for criminal activity in the NTSB in providing, fabricating, changing evidence both of a fraudulent nature and 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 uh, creating fraudulent evidence, the photoshopping that was done of these photos mm. to obscure uh, what really occurred in this event. This is criminal activity. This isn't just politics and well they said this and well somebody's. Been, this is criminal activity. A death is involved, and it was all about maintaining a person in office where there's now a question that's a legitimate question, if they're going to this level, number one, how deep is the deep right, state? Right. And how much do we actually have control of our government mm -hmm. when we're being lied to um, with uh, assets in this kind of a magnitude? Yeah, yeah. This was... Uh, Let me just add three small things, okay. uh, really quick. There's other coercive things involved here that have only been tangentially mentioned. One is the financial aspects, that is, scores of millions of dollars changed hands in all of this, uh, and it's just immense. And the retribution that's been involved, there has been uh, threats, there have been actions that have actually been taken that have hurt people. And thirdly, these Navy SEALs, for example, the secrecy aspect, that is, these pe are people who were used opportunistically because they are all under suborn secrecy yeah. that they cannot talk about any of the operations they've been on. And to get to the bottom of this, we need to be able to um, let them talk on some of these things. Yeah. Well, this is why we well, at, at, at Skywatch TV level have been saying... Or at a presidential level, there has to be some type of place, opportunity, where these people can speak uh, to what actually occurred... Um, without any threat or without any uh, uh, potential to violate their oaths. And I believe that in an honest investigation, uh, these people have a lot that they would like to say, mm -hmm. but they can't because uh, they're under uh, within a certain uh, uh, command structure that uh, they literally go to jail if they did speak. Yeah. So they're, they're essentially have been put in this catch-22 situation as fellow citizens where um, there hasn't been a opportunity, an avenue, a mechanism where they can provide the information that's needed that they have in order to get to the truth of what actually occurred here. Uh, FBI investigations with proper authorities and uh, congressional oversight of investigations, uh, even a demand from Trump for these investigations to occur, uh, would provide a mechanism where these people can provide their information um, uh, free from any uh, duress uh, or threat uh, because they have somehow violated a secrecy oath that they're under. Yeah, and this is why we uh, at Skywatch TV, where uh, I, I spend my, my weekdays, uh, have been saying for quite some time now that we, uh, as uh, Christian Americans, uh, American Christians, need to pray for our president and pray for those around him, because uh, certainly uh, if such an investigation were to be launched, I mean, just one of many reasons why we say we need to pray for him, but if such an investigation were to be launched, certainly the deep state would not go down without a fight. And as we can see from the evidence, uh, and I, uh, knowing that we've only scratched the surface of what's in the book, The Fuddy Hoax, uh, they don't fight fair. Uh, so this is something that uh, we, we uh, are appreciative of the work that you've done. And uh, again, I will link in the show notes either at vftb.net, well, both at vftb.net. And if you're watching this on video at YouTube, uh, look in the, in the uh, description below because I will have links to the previous interviews that Hugo Fugan has done on this particular topic. The book is The Fuddy Hoax. You can get it in hardback and also as a PDF download, which contains links to multimedia files 
many of which we have discussed during the previous hour or so. Uh, and you'll find that at the website, thefuddyhoax.com. Uh, again, I know we've only scratched the surface here, but I am under some time constraints today. Uh, but uh, uh, let, if, me, let me just add yeah. 30 seconds here. One, one thing that is a, a critically important, and okay. why is this relevant now? This happened years ago. Listen, folks. This person who was kept in office through fraud, through this criminal activity, is still active and trying to influence the direction of the country. And the right. people behind right. him who put him there are still in play. Right. The legitimacy of his presidency and his legitimacy to be in this conversation at this time within our national system within the international politics if this is a staged event if this was a propaganda militarized propaganda uh thing against the american people his specific legitimacy to be in the national conversation right now is null and void That's and right. he shouldn't be listened to and those people supporting him in this shouldn't be listened to he should not be on the national stage he should be potentially involved in some type of criminal indictment if he authorized or had any participation or knowingly allowed this fraud to occur to keep him in the presidency. Mm. Well, whether he did or he didn't, the fact that this was used to keep him in power by persons unknown uh, should delegitimize his uh, presidency and whatever influence he still wields today with his uh, uh, alternative and White that's House. that's the key point. Yeah, yeah. What, is the key, what is his legitimacy to be in the conversation right now? Right. This fraud being what it is, he should not be part of our national conversation because of those frauds. This event specifically establishes that point. That's why we're raising it now. That's why it's still relevant right. now. This is the one that's developed enough to allow for actual legal action, congressional, FBI investigations, etc., to get to the bottom of what occurred here. Who was involved? What did they know? When did they know it? What was their personal involvement in, in perpetrating this fraud? Amen. Uh, w, thank you for your input. And who's still left? And, and who's still you know, left, yes. Uh, well, we, uh, again, this is a conversation we've been having at Skywatch TV for the last month. Uh, and, uh, you know, God bless uh, men like Lieutenant Colonel Bob McGinnis, who's still inside the Pentagon as a consultant and uh, seeing some of the things that goes on there. I'm sure he knows things that he can't tell us about, but uh, uh, he has impl- uh, hinted at things that are, are quite uh, dark. And uh, this is the physical manifestation of some of that um, uh, some of that darkness. Uh, the Death of Loretta Fuddy, the book The Fuddy Hoax, co-authors uh, Nellie Ristvet and Hugo Fugan, who's been our guest along with W. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time today, and uh, perhaps we can do this again and dig into some more depth. My pleasure. Thank you. Now, I know we only scratched the surface, even in a 90-minute program, we barely scratched the surface of the evidence that uh, Hugo and uh, his uh, associate have uh, put together on the Loretta Fuddy crash. It is um, clearly evident from just what we presented in this program today that the official story is not what happened on December 11th of 2013. Um, I encourage you to uh, get the book, to check out the earlier interviews, which again, I will link to in the show notes below this video, or if you're listening to this as a podcast, check out the show notes at vftb.net. And I'll put links there to the interviews that uh, Hugo has done over the past uh, year with uh, Joe and Doug Hagman, with uh, John B. Wells and others. Uh, They've got a number of them linked at the website, thefuddyhoax.com, under the media tab at the website there. But uh, again, I will link to that in the show notes as well. Um, What really did happen? And what is the aftermath? Is Loretta Fuddy still alive somewhere? That is entirely possible. But again, once you start by dismantling the official story, then the next question is, why was a story concocted about this particular event? And who benefits? Qui bene? Who stands to gain from putting forward the false story about the crash of this plane uh, in 2013? And again, why is it still relevant today? Well, of course, the uh, deeper state And the work, the uh, books that we've been uh, talking about on Skywatch TV over the last month have a lot to say about that. Uh, The Deeper State by uh, Lieutenant Colonel Bob McGinnis, Saboteurs by Tom Horn, 
And then Gods and Thrones by Pastor Carl Gallups, which looks at the spiritual source behind all of this. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers of this present darkness, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's the Apostle Paul, and presumably he knew what he was writing about. Coming up next weekend, next Sunday, November 19th, uh, we will talk to uh, Doug Woodward. Haven't had him back on the program for a while. And a new friend, Gary Huffman. Had the opportunity to meet Gary at the conference, the Hear the Watchman conference in Boise, Idaho. Uh, This is their book, The Revealing, Unlocking Hidden Truths on the Glorification of God's Children. Um, We'll get into the uh, theology here and uh, see what revelations they have for us in the book, The Revealing. See that? play on words I I did there. Uh, That will be next Sunday, the 19th, on A View from the Munker. We'll probably take the week after that as a holiday week, that being the week of Thanksgiving. Uh, I, myself, working on a new manuscript, trying to get a new book uh, together and out. I've got um, two outlined and ideas for more, but uh, one thing at a time. So right now working on uh, a book based on the presentation that I've given at uh, Oklahoma City and in um, Boise, or uh, at Branson, rather, this year. So uh, that is uh, next up on my plate. Um, the uh, Speaking of the conference in uh, Oklahoma City, or Norman, Oklahoma, actually, the Blessed Hope Prophecy Forum, the DVD sets are available and uh, will be shipping in January. So if you weren't able to attend and didn't take advantage of the live stream, or if you just want a hard copy that you can play at your leisure and share with friends, you can uh, get those through our friends at Prophecy Watchers. Um, sign up, get those at uh, prophecywatchers.com. Every speaker, every presentation, so uh, basically about 65, 66 presentations over the course of the weekend from the uh, speakers there, including Tom Horn, L.A. Marzulli, uh, Dr. Tommy Ice, uh, Bill Salas, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, uh, me, Sharon Josh Peck, Dr. Michael Lake, um, Tim Alberino, many others on that. And again, you'll find more information at prophecywatchers.com. Uh, Here the Watchmen, another coming, another conference coming to Dallas. This will be March 22nd through the 25th of 2018. You can register now and uh, get an early bird discount, if you will. Bill Salas will be joining the lineup at Here the Watchmen. Uh, Rabbi Zev Parat coming back from Tel Aviv. We look forward to seeing him and his wife Lynn again. Pastor Paul Begley, Pastor Carl Gallops again. L.A. Marzuli, Dr. Michael Lake, Mark Taylor co-author of the Trump Prophecies will be there. Uh, Josh Tolley, uh, me, Sharon, Josh Peck, uh, Pastor Casper McLeod, and more. For information and registration, hearthewatchmen.com. That's hearthewatchmen.com. Please, if you get in a moment, give us a review. Appreciate that at uh, the VFTB page at iTunes or on Stitcher, wherever else you find us, which, of course, is wherever fine podcasts are sold. And you can uh, give us a like at Facebook, follow up, and uh, make comments on the programs there at the Facebook page. That's uh, facebook.com slash viewfromthebunker, which is a production of Gilbert House and released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 4.0 international license. The opening theme is by Kevin McLeod. His website is incompetech.com. The opening announcer is DC Good. As before, remember, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is A View from the Bunker. Bunker.